Hello, I'm Amy Hanna from Queen's University and I'm here today to speak with Dr Alison McKenzie, uh, also at Queen's, about uh, social epistemology and childhood studies. Alison, thank you so much for such an interesting and thought-provoking presentation. And I've had a few questions um, that I was thinking while I was watching your presentation and of course in conversations that um, we have had in the centre here at Queen's before. And the first question I wanted to ask you was that in your presentation, you give examples of children lacking credibility when in confrontation with adults, for example, in school, criminal justice um, health settings, and they are all examples of testimonial injustices. Hermeneutical injustices in Miranda Fricker's framework are still very abstract in childhood studies. Mm -hmm. What do you think are examples of hermeneutical injustices faced by children and young people in our society today? Well, I think it, I think it might be helpful to be to begin by remembering that it's very difficult to set to to separate out the testimonial from the hermeneutical, and particularly when we bear in mind the construct of epistemic injustice that that Fricker has developed in her book, and then other thinkers like. Medina have developed. So, and if we remember that hermeneutical injustice is about the practices that disinhibit or disable or prevent or occlude, obstruct people from either contributing to knowledge, uh, being able to define, to explain, to illustrate, to contribute to social meanings, then if there are groups of people who are systematically marginalized from these processes, like children, like women, like people of color, and so on and so forth, then there are going to be very clear hermeneutical disadvantages. And I think children fit into all of these categories. Um, your own work and your own thesis, indeed the work that the centre has done with respect to children's rights and how we conceive of the child. What is a child? What can a child possibly know, et cetera, et cetera. And the authority that adults have over children, whether as a parent or as a teacher, makes it very difficult, I think, to talk about children being hermeneutically included. And that, in large part, that's to do with their maturity, what we believe these young people to know. So I think in most senses that the hermeneutical injustices that children face are many. Now, we've talked about this before. If we think about sex education in Northern Ireland, and indeed sex education in the United Kingdom as a whole, there are many of the view that sex education should be biological. So in a sense, we don't allow children to have the right to know what it means to have a proper, decent, informed sex education. And the consequence of that is, is how does a child understand consent? and what it means to give consent to something. Because it's very hard to do that if you don't have the background knowledge or you're simply not being informed or you haven't been educated in some way about what sex is, what sexuality is, what it's like to have a meaningful relationship in which you give joyous, uninhibited consent as opposed to forced or coercive consent. So I think that that's one example of a hermeneutical injustice. But I suppose the most fundamental one of all is, why don't we listen to children? And why don't we think that children have valuable contributions to make in school or to our educational resources or to the content of our lessons, for example? I think that's a fabulous example. Um, and I think it is another example of how uh, epistemic injustice maps very uh, nicely onto the children's rights framework, because of course, children have a right to knowledge and information um, that is appropriate for their age and their mm -hmm. development. Um, and I think it's very interesting that, that epistemic injustice is a very useful framework for considering the harms that it does to children when they do not have, when that right to information is not implemented and not enforced and not monitored in some ways. 
Um, and I think it's also interesting, going back to your presentation, to consider how um, in the social imagination, children are not viewed as epistemic agents and they are not viewed right. as, as having capacity to, um, to even uh, have those conversations around the information um, in, in sex education and relationship education, and then to have those ongoing conversations as epistemic agents about what are the implications for consent or meaningful relationships. And of course, um, you talk in your presentation as well about how this can follow children through all areas of their life. So, you know, this could have um, implications for health. It can have implications for well-being, education, um, you know, their place in society, how they engage with, for example, the criminal justice system. Um, and it has very far reaching implications. And I think that's um, I think it's an excellent example. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, Probably leading quite nicely on from that, um, the you speak in your presentation about um, institutions. We don't regularly ask young people for their views. And for all intents and purposes, there is a silence or an absence of children's views when it comes to big institutions, for example, health, education, criminal justice. Um, and the testimony that you talk about in your presentation largely revolves or centers around speech acts. And I'm wondering what role or function, if any, do you see for silence in the epistemic injustice framework? And is, is it just an absence or can silence be a form of testimony? Do you know, it's, it's so context dependent, I think. Mm. And I think that you have to uh, look at the role of silence over a period of time rather than at a specific point in time. So Flickr would talk about, you know, uh, that whether we see an epistemic injustice, hermeneutical or ten testimonial, it has to, it's contextual and it's temporal. And if you look at Medina's work, he would say, actually, we need to take that further and we have to look at the polyphonic context in which these testimonies or these silences occur. Now we know that in the education system, we're accustomed to asking children or young people to be silent in order to receive the message. You know, it's the role of the teacher to transmit to the child, it's the role of the child to receive. Now, that's a, that's a pedagogical act. Now, is that, is that a kind of hermeneutical silence? It may well be if in the act of the silence, the teacher is not interested in the social experiences of the children in front of her or doesn't solicit their views or their opinions or, or on a particular subject. I mean, I was thinking like, you know, in politics or in sociology or in English literature, these are wonderful opportunities to learn from the children themselves what it means to experience poverty or hunger, sexual aggression, violence, um, what it's like to go hungry or to come from a household in which there's no beds, for example. But if we rely only on the context of books to bring to life social experience without inviting those in front of us to contribute, then it's a form of preemptive silencing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But I mean, your own work has shown too that silence is an active stance and that it can be a chosen way of being if you want to protect your identity or you want to mark off a space that's your own and that is private and you want no intrusions from an authoritative person like a, like a teacher, but also that there's a silence in which that signifies embarrassment, fear, or just simply perplexity. And a sort of so, a source of protection as well. And again, to refer to your own work, and we've discussed this many times about developing a taxonomy of silence. And then once you have that taxonomy, how does it fit into a construction or conceptualization of epistemic injustice, depending on whether we go with Flickr alone or Medina or then combined? So I think there's a lot of interesting work actually that could be done there. Thank you. Um, 
it's really interesting, I think, even to think about um, all of those things, and, and my work's obviously based in education, but when we when we sort of zoom out into society and what's happening generally, I was really um, struck by the images of a protester recently who was protesting with a blank placard and the protester was arrested. Mm -hmm. And I thought that is a, there are no, um, there is no speech act there, but there is a speech act there. Um, and it, it's a silent one and, and just made me wonder how um, silences can be testimony or they can be uh, meaningful but as you say absolutely it's very context specific and it requires um observation and knowing uh knowing the the persons um, or the groups that you're dealing with and um and how they habitually use silence or not for example mm -hmm. if someone is um very talkative and very actively and vocally involved all the time um, if they are silent, for example, in a classroom scenario, they may be telling you something is wrong or they may be, like you say, they just wish for some privacy. So um, I think it's really interesting and it would be very interesting to look at that and map onto epistemic injustice and how that would contribute to the to the social epistemology in that area. And I think, well, I mean, the example of your um, silent protester with nothing written on the card, I mean, that's the performative aspect of silence. And it is one that, that, that could ar arouse a great deal of curiosity because there's power in having no words and hearing no words. And if one is curious, one would go up to that person and say, what is it that you're protesting about? <laughs> you know? But to be arrested merely for... So it's the symbolic act of taking up the stance of a protester, holding up a banner, even though there's nothing on that banner. It's the stance of a protester with no speech act present. Mm -hmm. And going back to the context, the context in which that protester stood. Exactly. It gave a lot of meaningful um, context to that situation. Um, as you explained in the end of your presentation, epistemic injustice, testimony, the social imagination, these um, core components and concepts of Fricker's framework are very beneficial to children's rights and childhood studies. And epistemic injustice has a crucial combination or contribution in explaining why children's rights and the right to be heard in particular when we talk about children's participation rights have struggled to be taken up by adults and struggle sometimes in their implementation, particularly considering the institutions um, that we, we've talked about previously in this session. Where do you think social epistemology might go? What direction do you think social epistemology might take in regard to children and childhood studies specifically from this point? Well, I don't know that there's much that we can do in schools without completely reforming the education system, and we know how difficult it is to do that. You know, if you, even if we just take the context of Northern Ireland alone, alone, I mean, review after review after review of the education system, nevertheless, the status quo prevails. So it's incredibly difficult to change systems. And England, I mean, reform after reform after reform of the, of the English education system too, and what really has changed in terms of the relationship of, of teacher to, to child or how we measure outcomes or academic attainment and so on and so forth. I think it's where we could make good progress, I think, is to marry con the conventions that we have, the Convention on the Child's of the Right, for example, and incorporate that into research using social epistemology, in this case, epistemic injustice. And I think that there are, there are a number of really good method methodologies out there now that you're very well aware of, participatory action research. So imagine a research project that, in, that involves participatory action research, the analysis, the analysis employed is epistemic injustice, because it would match so beautifully, which is power is empowerment, and it's about enabling the marginalized to contribute to the research as far as possible, making them co-producers of knowledge, co-contributors to the research process, and so on and so forth. And that's about giving voice 
and it's about allowing people to contribute to what we know and so the form the method of analysis theoretic analysis would be social epistemology that complements that approach so well so i think that that's certainly one direction that we could go in in children's rights and in our studies of um, childhood studies often I've been, you know, I've sat in supervisions and, uh, uh, you know, our very dear colleague who's a, an expert on children's rights and the conversation turns around to why don't we give, why do we not grant rights to children? You know, they have them superficially, they have them in a very, the most tokenistic way, but when it actually comes to respecting children's rights, we ignore them. Why? And I think, again, if we go back to the, to the structure of epistemic injustice and the role of um, prejudicial stereotypes, the role of um, credibility uh, um, assignment to particular individuals, the way that we conceive of people in the social imagination, and we take the child. Then I think that if we begin to look at it from those lenses, we can very well see why children's rights are contingent on their good behavior, for example. You know, what comes with the right is the idea of responsibility. As a secondary school teacher in Scotland who taught uh, rights in first and second year, year eight and year nine, the message is always in the curriculum with rights comes responsibilities. And if you don't exercise your responsibility, you lose the right. We don't say that to adults, generally speaking. So I think that's one direction that we could go in. Mm -hmm. It's also, I think, it's a misrepresentation of rights. Yes. If you don't uphold responsibilities, you do not lose your rights. No, absolutely. And I think it's very interesting, actually, you know, you mentioned teaching in Scotland. I think it's very interesting to see how incorporation of the convention into Scots law will, will influence the implementation of children's rights because now it will be in domestic law. That will change the claims that children can make. It will change um, the complaints procedures that children should have under that law. And then it will change and should change the, the redress that children have when, um, when their complaints are upheld. And what does that mean for school uh, contexts and environments where we've talked about how children are not seen as epistemic agents? Um, you talked there about the transmission of knowledge and facts mm. to children, and they um, are expected to regurgitate them. Yes. Which some might argue is, is an epistemic silence if they're not, you know, if they're not probing or evaluating or just returning knowledge you could argue is an epistemic silence, but um, I think that it, it, the social epistemology and particularly epistemic injustice is invaluable for explaining why there has not been that uptake. And it, it, it does center around credibility um, and children's, how children are viewed by society more broadly. Yes. And I think it would be challenging. I mean, even, even I, I mean, of course I applaud what's going on in Scotland. But we'll see how teachers change their attitudes mm. to young people and, and, the, and the levels of uptake. Because it's all very well. You know, women have rights, don't we? And they're, they're very hard won rights at that. And yet we know that our rights are violated quite systematically, be that in terms of unwanted sexual attention or now, and this is highly contentious, I know that, that women are having to give way in terms of giving up, you know, um, uh, you know, toilets and changing room spaces because of the transgender issue. And uh, there are very many women uh, uh, who don't want to share their private spaces with transgender women. Now, it depends on where you fall in that, on, on that, in, in, within that debate, but <laughs> who is it that is having to compromise, that is having to cede space and that is having to cede rights in order that another minority can be granted their rights? And sometimes I think one of the difficulties with rights is, is that competition between whose rights are respected more. But then behind that, of course, is who are the people we're talking about? 
How do we conceive them? What is our general attitude to them? Do we understand them? And do, and do we see them as beings who have entitlements and rights because we respect them fundamentally as human beings? But I think that that's another, going to be another burgeoning area where we can look at testimonial and hermeneutical injustice. Are men giving up their spaces? Good question. If we bring it back to um, the childhood studies, just you mentioned briefly participatory action research. I just want to ask you a very quick, brief question. If um, a researcher was going to do empirical research, so epistemic injustice is a fantastic um, theoretical framework with which to analyze research. But if someone was going out to collect empirical data, say in, in a school or in um, social work practice or in the criminal justice system, what would be your advice if they were choosing to use epistemic injustice as a framework? What would be your advice on how they should conduct empirical research? Well, I mean, there's this debate whether the, whether the research should be inductive or deductive. Mm. And of course, there's space for both. I mean, my, we, you and I, I think, had these conversations when you were doing your own research and whether you should do deductively or inductively. And I think either is, is, is appropriate. But I would say this, and I say it from, uh, a, 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 from an experience as a, a reviewer of papers is, if that is going to be the framework that researchers become thoroughly acquainted with it, there tends to be a desire to, to, to use it very superficially. And the key formulation is uh, uh, wronged in their capacity as a knower. And that's all some people seem to know about the theory. And that is simply not enough. So I suppose that if you're going to be collecting empirical data, it depends on the research question, obviously, uh, and it depends on what you want to find out. But um, presumably, if you believe that there is a sort of, um, there are epistemic injustices to be understood, then you frame research questions and sub-questions around the idea, the hunch, about what the injustice is. And use that as a starting point then yeah. to map mm -hmm. the methods you will use, the analytical framework that you will yes. use yeah. by epistemic injustice. Alison, thank you so much for such a wonderful Very conversation. Um, it's definitely given me things to think about and reflect upon, um, and uh, particularly in my own work. And um, of course, we have had lots of these conversations before and um, it's been thoroughly enjoyable so thank you very much thank you amy lovely to talk to you again